Hi everybody, thanks for being here today. I want to talk a little bit about uh, words and lawyers. English is not my first language, so I'm fascinated about the use of language and words and how it is abused and used in the battle against justice. 13 years ago when I started working with Julian, preparing the release of the collateral murder video, I'm sure that all of you have seen, it struck me that uh, they used the word engagement in a certain context. No, for me, engagement was something that had a pleasant connotation. This was the use, the word that used when people got together and decided to tie the knot, as I think you call it, until death to them apart. But in the vocabulary of the American military, engagement, yes, it does have to do with death, but it means fatal killing. That is the engagement that the lawyers in Pentagon came up with when they drew up the rules, the rules of engagement. And those were the rules the lawyers drew up and the helicopter pilots were thinking about when they asked for permission to engage, to open fire, to assassinate Matasha Tomal, an innocent civilian who came upon the scene to save the life of an injured man, Said Sma, word for Reuters. Permission to engage, they asked. Give us permission to engage. Before they opened fire and sprayed 30 millimeter hollow bullets upon the vehicle where inside were the two children, Said and Sma, who were only saved because their father threw his body over them and shielded them in front of the car. Think about these lawyers who are sitting, drawing up these documents, finding new meanings to these words. Engagement. It's killing. And think about the fact that Julian is being indicted for publishing these rules of engagement. You are not even allowed or supposed to see the rules they play by in their assassination games, in wars. They do not charge him for publishing the collateral murder video for one purpose only, because they do not dare to have that shown in a courtroom at any point. And you know why. This is how they use language. We all know how the lawyers in Pentagon and the Department of Justice drew up manuals on how the military could torture prisoners. But of course they didn't call it torture. What shall we call it so it sounds better? Enhanced interrogation techniques. That's waterboarding 80 times, 90 times. Electrocution, hanging up on the hand until you are disjointed on the arms. Torture, pure, no enhanced interrogation techniques. Bravo. Thank now, you. I want to draw up a little scene that we came to learn about in January this year, when Mike Pompeo, former CIA director, later Secretary of State, yes. 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 Mike Pompeo was director of CIA in 2017, and he was very hopeful that he could become the Republican nominee for election next year. So of course he published a book, his memoir, his fond memoir, from the halls of power when he was director of CIA and later Secretary of State. And think about this. He tells a story that just before Christmas 2017, he sat in a cozy atmosphere with his family. Think about this atmosphere. And the wife is preparing the dinner, I guess. There are decoration, the Christmas tea is up, the gifts on the floor. And he tells that he was sitting, browsing through and reading the manual on extrajudicial killings. Shame! That's the Christmas that Pompeo wanted and liked the most. And why is this relevant? Yes, because we now know that in the same period, 
because of brave journalists who did deep investigation. There were plans being drawn up to assassinate Julian Assange. Sure. To kill him or assassinate him in the Ecuadorian embassy. A real plan that was introduced in the White House. And we furthermore know this because two brave witnesses who are protected have issued a statement that they knew about this plan and poisoning was being discussed. That was what Pompeo was concocting just before Christmas 2017 by head of the CIA. What do you mean no? Pompeo! No. We are possibly not going to hear about all this in the court of law, in the extradition hearing, and the high court. Why? Because on 6th of January, Justice Swift, as he is named, his name is Justice Swift, decided after almost nine months of deliberation to spit out three and a half pages of his ruling that he's on no reason for Julian Assange to have an appeal in the High Court. No ruling at all. He complained about the mass of paperwork and documents that he was pestered to go through. 200 pages, too long. It's about a man's life. That's a defense document. It should have been less. I see nothing there. The story about the plan to kidnap and kill Julian Assange no, it's just a journalistic story. It's based on 30 named and unnamed sources published in Yahoo News, written by three prominent investigative journalists. No, it's just some speculation by our journalists. The protective witnesses who knew that there was a plan to poison Julian Assange. No, not worthy of being heard in the High Court in London, said Justice Swift. And on and on he went, in the three and a half pages. He didn't go through any details. He didn't bother. That document, you should read it. It clarifies for us that the entire judicial process in this country is a facade. Yeah. It's a total facade. Yes, it and it's injustice, persecution, cloaked in to make it look like it's justice, but it's not. And the more steps we take in the courts here in London, the more obvious it becomes. And Justice Swift, he doesn't even spend much effort in trying to cloak the real fact of the matter that he had already decided to take a politicized opinion before he even got the 200 documents. And I doubt that he read through the entire thing. He was probably reading the memoirs by the great Mike Pompeo at the time. <laughs> On Jonathan Swift! My struggle. good friend Craig Murray wrote an excellent piece the other day. Please read him and support him. He is very good. And he reminded people how fascism and Nazism crept into the German psyche in the 30s. And there was no shortage of lawyers and scholars, legal scholars, to write up the justification for the wrongdoing. And at the Nuremberg trial, there was no shortage of documents, probably more than 200, as a defense document. Oh, listen, it's all in the laws. It has been passed on laws, and these legal scholars, they said I was in the right. And we got the orders to do it. It's called the Nuremberg defense. It was dismissed at the Nuremberg trial. When it comes to these heinous acts, you have to be accountable. No matter what the lawyers have drawn up, yes. no matter what the facade is, and that is what we are going to be having in mind. Yes. We are going to hold these people account. Every yes. individual yes. that has taken part in this persecution against Julian Assange, do not forget that. Yes. We will get history, if not history, to judge these people, and they will be spat on. Yes. Yes. The sons and daughters and granddaughters and grandsons, they will be ashamed of the legacy of those individuals in the court, in the entire bloody corrupt system who took part in this persecution. But we are all almost running out of time. We need to save a man's life. We need to save journalism. We need to act now and we cannot stay silent.
we need to scream out from the top of our voice. Stop this! No, no. No extradition! Free Julian Assange! We are at five minutes to midnight in this case. There is a crucial and possibly final court case on the horizon. When the announcement comes of the date of that case, please be ready. Kristen Raffinson, we have heard a lot about radical transparency today in one speech, about Americans being brainwashed into thinking Julian had just dumped information. Now, for those of us who were in the courtroom, we heard of the ingenious way that Julian had invented using a dictionary, for example, finding words that weren't in the dictionary, they were proper names. So can you tell us something about redaction? Because it seems to me that this is so important. Well, I mean, I, it's, it's shocking that, that these evidence uh, that you were mentioning uh, which is, is, is so much goes against this propaganda narrative which is being held up. We are not allowed possibly to present it to a high court because it's a, it's a huge, of course, argument in favor of Julian. I can tell you, and I testify to that, that after 20 years in the mainstream media, often handling uh, leaked material and, uh, and uh, sensitive issues, I have never ex experienced as solid diligence in handling material and sensitivity in handling the material as in the case of Julian when we were working on the 2010-2011 uh, publications. Great links that uh, Julian and the team went to in, in order to safeguard every sensitivity. We went further, actually, in some instances, in that process, that the mainstream media that we were cooperating with, we redacted more than the New York Times. People, there was absolutely no dumping of material. Careful, journalistic, sensible curation of the material before it was presented to the public, both when it came to the Afghan warlock, the Iraq warlock, and the diplomatic cables especially. So this propaganda voice that's been hammered on for 13 years now and echoed in the mainstream media is totally without any foundation. And it's so easy to just, if people would listen, to present them with the evidence of it. And it's in the court documents that Julian is now trying to present in his appeal, but possibly will not be heard. Well, in the case of the State Department cables, didn't Julian also contact the United States government and request their help? Productions and what happened? There, there was there were there were more than one approaches and attempts to involve the State Department and offer to create an alliance at the outset and uh, at, uh, in, in the summer of 2011, when of course through the betrayal of, of two Guardian journalists and, and other former uh, insiders and WikiLeaks, uh, the material was exposed. Then, of course, steps were taken to, to uh, warn the State Department and offer to assist in uh, reacting to that possible scenario. That was not answered. And bear in mind, when it came to the diplomatic cables, as has been testified to in the courts in London, the primary publisher of the material, in the end, of the full unreducted material, was not WikiLeaks. It was an American entity. Crypto. Crypto. Yes. And even uh, Mr. Young, the founder of Crypto, has offered sue me. Because he knows that he will can take on a fight on the First Amendment basis. The protection that is now being fiddled with in the public discourse that Julian will be denied. So that message alone to journalists at core in Australia and all around the world should be enough to say, wait a minute, so you're going to have a separate rule for American journalists called the First Amendment Protection, but anybody else who reports on their 
issues, exposes their corruption, their war crimes, he is fully exposed. That should send shockwaves, and I don't think people realize what kind of a horrible scenario could emerge from that. Well, it's exactly as uh, Stella said in her talk last night, uh, it's a war between accountability and impunity. And what you're talking about somewhat ensures impunity. Yeah, and we've, so, of course we have so many stories reflecting that. Can you just imagine, now we have only we have, we have the, the, the torture program of the CIA exposed. Who has been held accountable for that? Not a single person. Only person who went to jail because of that is the whistleblower who exposed it, John Kiriak. That is the twisted world we now live in and exemplifies what we are dealing with and what people need to realize that we need to change, to change the scale and actually fight for against this impunity for these heinous acts. So can I ask you uh, just a practical question? Uh, so we were awaiting for Julian to appear in front of those two judges. Um, do we have any idea of how soon that could happen? And after that, if they judge negatively, how soon it would be before he could possibly be extradited? Well, this is the issue. We have no idea. And this is part of the psychological warfare and torture against Julia to have this constant uncertainty on all steps of the case. There have been no indication of when that could happen. It could be a tomorrow that they announce that in a week's time there's going to be in the court. They can wait and wait and wait. But it could be before, the entire thing could be over in the British courts before summer recess on July 31st, before the end of the next month. But we simply don't know. And there's anybody's guess. And you have you cannot rely on any precedents in the court histories here, because all these precedents are null and void when it comes to Julian. There is a Julian's exemption on the way the judiciary has been handling his case from day one. Day one. Yeah. Well, Expose the fact it's nothing to do with the law. It's persecution, as I said in my talk here, cloaked in this uh, judicial uh, uh, fake curtain. It's a potenting curtains of a legal process that we are witnessing here. And that has been exposed in the process in the courts here. Well, in the appeal, um, the case of Laurie Love was brought up and uh, Justice Burnett drew a distinction between Julian and Love because Love was suffering from a physical condition as well. Shouldn't that medical assessment, because the, the assurances only were only given on the basis of a mental health condition. Now, since Julian, that was the very day Julian had his stroke, by the way, shouldn't that be the medical grounds be reviewed in view of the, the fact there is no a uh, doctor even in ADC, there's no doctor permanently on staff and it would be a very complicated procedure. Well, of course, uh, I am absolutely certain that the lawyers are looking into that, but you have to pass the hurdles to actually be heard in the court. Yes. That is the problem. What kind of justice is that you don't have actually a possibility to raise these arguments. But there's one more appearance. Can't it be stated that that distinction that Burnett made no longer applies? Well, as much as you can squeeze in the half hour that they have allocated for the total process. Yes. So that means the defense entire... gets 15 minutes, is that right? That is what we are, we are, we are saying, of course, the need to extend that. Are you going to, are you going to have 15 minutes to, to argue for his life? Is that the justice we're going to see here? I would not be surprised, but of course there would be a demand to extend that. I want to ask you about the end game here that we seem to be in. I know it's a political case, it's about pop, popular uh, support for him that's really crucial, but there is a legal process. Yeah. At least in name, it's a legal process. Yeah. If, what role could the European Court of Human Rights play yeah. And how would that work out? Because I'm hearing that they would have to get either a judge here or the Department of Ministry of Justice 
to issue the injunction. It doesn't come directly from you. That would give them time to lose the papers. Yeah. Uh, is that what you were afraid of? Well, I, for one thing, you know, when I read Justice Swift's uh, uh, document, uh, which is not a, doesn't take you long, and you can read between the lines what kind of a, uh, uh, how, how dismiss, totally dismissive it is. He doesn't even try to hide the fact that he, I mean, he came to that uh, conclusion before he heard any argument, before he read a single document. I'm absolutely certain of that. It, it sort of reeks of that. And, and still took not, 11 months to issue. Well, nine months, I think. It's okay. issued in September. Uh, and and, and his, his name is ironically Justice Swift. Well, uh, but that's part of this, the uh, the psychological torture against Julia and the stalling process on every 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 step of the way. Now, we of course have now this 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 possibility, which Justice Swift has actually narrowed, to present the case for two judges in a renewed application for appeal. Which astonishingly, is Swift can narrow the scope of the documents that are presented to 20 pages and actually only gives half an hour to present the case, which, which at least from the outset when you read it, it sounds like that's for both parties. So I'm, I'm saying, are, are they going to give him 15 minutes to, uh, to actually fight for his life? It's, it's absurd. So I'm not too hopeful for that outcome. What, of course, the lawyers for Julians are ready to uh, immediately petition to the, uh, the Strasbourg court to take his case on and issue uh, uh, a request to stay the extradition based on so-called Rule 39. Uh, that, that could be within hours. Uh, and uh, until now, the British government has abided by the rule. But there's a lot of controversy, and the, and the, the conservatives here in, 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 the, in this house uh, are furious that the Strasbourg court was interfering in the deportation of uh, refugees to Rwanda. So there's a huge opposition to that, and I fear that they will either not wait for the, uh, the signal from uh, Strasbourg, you know, request to stay if it comes, because it only takes an hour to drive to the airport from Belmar's prison, or they will ignore Strasbourg court and find some legal justification that saying it's it's not an order it's just a, a request so we're in the right to do so and by the way this is interference with our sovereignty and all that uh, bs that is being presented constantly and was the basis of the brexit and for the basis of them uh, totally uh, shattering international institutions the united nations uh, and mechanisms that have saved lives that have been destroyed in the julian Julian's process, the working group of Aberdeen detention, which was ignored, the, uh, uh, the the special rapporteur on torture that was totally ignored. Can you imagine? They've undermined the international system, this fragile system, which our human rights are globally is based on. This is the intensity of the fight that we are fighting. It's on all fronts, and nothing is spared. So I do fear that the uh, the European Court of Human Rights will not get a chance to intervene or will be ignored and dismissed if they do. Even though it's legally binding on Britain. And they haven't, there is, is legislation, I think, to get out of that. But I, have, still I, in it. I have, I spoke about the laws and yeah. the, 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 right. the, the legal scholars. I've seen an Oxford yes. scholar in this country write, and you can just imagine what kind of a party affiliation he has. Uh, his, his, his legal scholarly opinion that you could actually ignore Rule 39 but still be a part of the treaty. What I'm really afraid of is that uh, even if the European Court of Human Rights decides to intervene and, and issues a, a, a requests or an order to stay the extradition, it will be ignored here. Uh, and they will find some legal justification to say that, yes, we will abide by the treaty in generally for a while at least, because there's so much in the balance there. I mean, the Good Friday Agreement, peace in Northern Ireland, is basically hanging on that, uh, that, that, that uh, human rights treaty. So they, that's the only reason why they haven't dismissed it entirely so far. But they will find some legal scholar, and I've actually seen papers explaining that, yes, you can uh, decide not to abide by Rule 39, but still be a part of the treaty. 
So this is what I, I call, you know, what I'm afraid of. This is how fascism creeps up, up on you with good help of, of lawyers. There's always enough lawyers who are willing and able to create this, this, this fancy paperwork or take part in court proceedings, creating the justification and the facade of legality. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm afraid it will come to that, but for that uh, to happen or stopping that to happen, of course, we need uh, a, a universal outcry, an outrage, especially among the European leaders who have cowardly and shamefully stayed silent when not even supporting the Prime Minister of Australia and the opposition leaders. How is it that, that we have to go to Latin American presidents to get full support from country after country after country who issue statement and takes the issue up with the, the Biden's uh, uh, himself personally? Half a billion people in these countries that I visited in the last few months in Latin America were totally on board and understand the gravity because that's in their living memory they know what they're dealing with you know you don't have to convince anybody in Latin America about you know kidnapping killing plans of the CIA uh -huh, of course I mean that's right that's why involvement of, of the Department of Justice in 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 in, uh, in a corrupt court proceedings like they did against Lula now it is well established that the Brazilian president was unjust to, 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 was, was was basically thrown in jail on, on cooked up charges and the Department of Justice of the US did have a hand in, the, in that process, in the Petrobras case, etc, etc. So they understand. And I, I am I'm so frustrated that we are not getting these voices on the top political level in Europe because that's where the levers could be. And uh, I thought it, we, would, we would be already there with the bipartisan support in Australia, with you know, that strong statements made by Albanese. And it was almost shattering when he was came over the coronation weekend to London and said, very diplomatically, I am frustrated. Well, we all know when diplomats speak what that means. Yeah. That, is a, that is strong words. Right. Uh, so other world leaders that actually do care about President need to support him as well. So what are we dealing with? We're trying to save an individual, a man's life. And, and, and the American government is even ready to sacrifice or upset relations with the most important, important partner in the Pacific, which is now a member of this little cozy NATO expansion over to the Pacific in the AUKUS alliance. That is remarkable, but that should be a wake-up call to people. This is where we are. It is about Julian, yes, as an individual, but it's about underlying principles that are at stake here. This is the line in the sand for so many things, so many things. Thank you, Chris.